Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for joining today's HCV utilization webinar. Had um, dash V A S H or VASH. <laughs> Please know that our audience co audio connections will be muted to minimize background noise. You are welcome to submit written questions via the chat panel, and these will be addressed during Q&A. To ask a question verbally, click the raised hand icon located at the bottom of the screen to place yourself in the queue. When it's your turn to speak, simply click the unmute button in the pop-up message that will appear on your screen. Please remember, state your name and affiliation <laughs> prior to your comments. You are able to access live transcription on this event by clicking on the correspondent icon at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send a chat to the event producer. With that, I will turn the meeting over to Patrick Hatch. Patrick, please go ahead. Oh, thanks, Michelle. Hello, everybody. Uh, how's it going? Happy uh, HUD VASH webinar day two. We're going to go to the next slide. As always with these utilization calls, they are indeed recorded. And we, you know, within about a week or so, we get both uh, the recording and the slides up for uh, posterity. Uh, if anyone has any thoughts for future webinars on the utilization topic or anything even tangential to that, we'd be happy to hear those. Definitely send them our way. Uh, so on the question front, uh, Michelle walked through sort of the ways, yeah, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this. We're going to pause partway through for any potential questions uh, from the phone, uh, quote unquote. And then we're also going to stop at the, we're going to also open it up at the end, but certainly throughout uh, present, or I should say submit questions through the chat. And we will try and hit those when the relevant discussion is occurring. And uh, as always, we like to push our HCV Connect newsletter, where we sort of hit on a lot of the things related to uh, utilization. So, uh, you know, sign up and uh, you'll start to get those very exciting emails because I know you all enjoy emails from HUD and we'd like to give you more. Next slide, please. So uh, we're going to, before we dive into BASH, a couple of quick announcements. Uh, the first is that it's fortuitous that we're doing a utilization call today because tomorrow, the 16th of June, are uh, some key uh, funding opportunity deadlines are hitting. So if you, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the funding implementation notice, but of note, uh, the lower than average leasing set aside, the PBV set aside, and the portability, there's a couple others, but those are uh, three key ones. Uh, those applications are all due tomorrow. So uh, if you have not yet applied uh, or you have no idea what I'm talking about, definitely take a look at the implementation notice, see if you are at all eligible. Even if you're not sure, maybe submit anyway. Uh, better to be uh, declined than not to try. Uh, so please do that uh, so we can make sure that we can get this, uh, this set aside money that comes in the appropriations bill each year for these categories to the right folks. Uh, and then the second, we want to just uh, real quickly touch on uh, a NOFO here on the housing mobility side. So if you want to go to the next slide, we're going to hand it to Molly. Great. Um, so yeah, we just wanted to quickly uh, announce that HUD recently announced that there are new funds available to support housing mobility programs through a new NOFO. Um, this NOFO will make up to uh, $25 million available for PHAs that administer HCV programs. Um, applications are going to be due August 30th. And through this NOFO, we expect to make about 11 total awards and the PHAs will administer their programs for about five full years. Uh, we anticipate that over 6,000 families will be able to participate and receive um, supports uh, accessing a much broader range of neighborhoods. Uh, next slide, please. So if you're interested in learning more about this NOFO opportunity, uh, HUD is conducting an hour-long webinar on June 22nd at 2 p.m. Eastern, and there are some data tools that have to be used for the application, and we're conducting a separate webinar on that on July 13th at 2 p.m., um, also Eastern time. 
Uh, for additional information, you can contact Allison Bell at housingmobility at HUD.gov. Uh, thank you, and I will hand it back over to Patrick. Obviously, you guys cannot click on the register here. Uh, that will we'll be posting the PowerPoint where you can click on that, and then here in maybe a minute or two, I'll go ahead and drop that uh, both of those in the chat just so that you have them in the moment. We want to bounce on to the next slide. So we are going to be talking about VASH today, and I just wanted to, uh, sometimes all of our special purpose vouchers uh, are uh, very important, right? The populations that they serve um, are worthy, and uh, today we're going to be talking about the veterans, obviously. I just wanted to make sure that we keep some of this in a little bit of perspective here. So you can see we've got a little pie chart there on the left, and this pie chart represents the full leasing for the voucher program for March. And when I say uh, sort of this regular voucher program, um, we're excluding the mainstream and the EHV since those are funded uh, a little bit differently. So just you can kind of see the size of the pie that is the regular program. And then you can see the other pieces, right? Bash, up and Ned. And then you can see the mainstream and EHV that, as I mentioned, are funded a little bit differently. But if we stick those in there, you can see the different slices there of the pie. And that uh, particular bash slice there is about 3% overall. So it's, you know, in terms of numbers, it's still a very large number, which we'll get to in a second. But in terms of, you know, a 2 million plus program, the percent is a little, is, is smaller. So I just wanted to give a little bit of scale there that our special purpose vouchers uh, with the inclusion of those two separately funded ones are about 7% of the sort of broad voucher program. Um, and uh, yeah, let's go to the next slide. Can you guys see this okay? Give me a... Molly, thumbs up. Yes. Okay, awesome. So, uh, want to just also give a little perspective on bash leasing here uh, as we take a look at it from the perspective of, of state. So, on the left there again is March leasing or the bash program by state. You can see, you know, broadly speaking, a lot of states are sort of in the sixty to eighty on up to maybe ninety percent. Uh, range. I also include a little chart there on the right to give an idea of scale in terms of where these VASH units exist, right? So we're talking essentially the UMAs on the right there. And in what it won't be a surprise, you can see uh, that an awful lot of them reside in California, the dark blue over there on the, on the West Coast. Um, and then also right Texas, Florida, New York are also a little bit darker blue. So there's more VASH uh, there. And then um, the leasing, to some extent, if there's a lot more, for example, you can see in, in California, the leasing is lower than the average. The average for the country is about 70% for, for BASH. And if we translate this to uh, actual uh, unleased vouchers, right, that means uh, we've got 30% not leased. So this is about 34,000 um, BASH vouchers. And uh, much like in the regular program, there are a lot of hurdles to clear here on the leasing front. Um, so we thought it'd be good to sort of start this conversation today by uh, chatting with one of our housing authorities and uh, to do a little introduction for them. I'm going to hand it off to the public housing director in uh, New York, Luigi. Luigi, uh, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you, Patrick, and good afternoon. Um, first, uh, Patrick, thank you for inviting me to participate Um as a director of the New York Office of Public Housing, my office oversees some of the largest PHAs in the country and they in turn run many of HUD's programs. And I believe, uh, as you said, one of the best HUD programs is the HUD VASH program, not only because of the housing and services it provides our veterans, but also it sets the example of success in, in how there's collaboration between the VA, HUD, and the local PHAs. And I think here in New York, we have that perfect combination with all the partners uh, working together. And, uh, and as you see, though, the, the, the vast utilization numbers are success. And so uh, uh, it's, we're proud of those, that success. And, uh, but none of that would be possible uh, without the hard work of NYCHA staff under the leadership of Lakeisha Miller, the Executive Vice, Pre Executive Vice President of Leased Housing. So Lakeisha, the floor is yours, and we look forward to your presentation and, and sharing some of those best practices. Thank you, Luigi. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to say thank you to Patrick and team as well for having us today. 
um, we are happy to share a little bit about our program and what has made us a success in this process. Um, as you mentioned, Luigi, collaboration here in the city is key. That, that carries the program a long way. Um, if we could put up the slide, I can give an overview of our program. Um, I have two of my key staff members here with me today. We have on the line, Alex Matthew, who's the director for Brooklyn Client Services. His unit deals with that application referral process and the rental process. And I also have on the line, Robert Testerero, who is a central office director who participates in a lot of the engagements and the, um, the work groups throughout the city as it concerns the vast population. So as you can see, we have a pretty large allocation. We have 3,385 vouchers allocated to NYCHA as part of our Section 8 program. Currently, we have 3,117 under lease, but we are constantly working with our VA partners to make sure that we're getting more. Hi, everybody. This is Michelle. I am so sorry for the interruption. There was some uh, outage. I do apologize. Um, and so I don't know if you guys realize that we had dropped, but um, we can continue if you are ready. Yes, we're going on, Michelle. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Um, currently, we have 145 voucher holders in the VASH program that are actively searching for a rental unit. And year to date, we actually had 105 successful rentals. As you all know, with the VASH program, you know, we're, we're dealing with a very, um, I will say a sensitive population. And some of the criteria that qualifies them for this program can also um, play later on after rental and part of managing their participation on the program. So what we've noticed in our program over the last five years is there is a relatively solid 5% attrition rate each year. Uh, we noticed that some of the, the veterans that we are able to house, you know, they go back to being homeless, Unfortunately, also during the pandemic, we did lose a lot of um, veterans, single households. So we are still working in partnership with the VA and a local um, Department of Veteran Services through the mayor's office to make sure that we keep the flow of VASH applications active. So in that relationship, everyone, um, so we're working with the Housing Authority, along with the, the Veterans Center, and in New York City, we're also working with the Mayor's Office, um, Department of Veteran Services. We were one of the first programs in the country to actually take part in the VASH continuum when it came out, I want to say around 2015. So that's when we started the relationship outside of the VA. And through that relationship, we have been able to explore um, different housing resources. So under relationship management, that's one thing that we will say to you all about the successes of the program is to keep your, your options open. Right now, we by keeping our options open, we have been able to kind of mix up our portfolio of rentals a little bit we're starting to branch out a little bit more into the project-based world for VASH voucher holders um, locally. So we have about 7% of our VASH voucher holders are actually rented in project-based units. Um, and it doesn't interfere with their ability to continue receiving services with their VA center, which is a, a great component for them. Um, another thing that helps in the successes of our program is keeping the VA and the Department of Veterans Services actively engaged in every step after eligibility. With our general population, once you do that rental, 
you know, it's just kind of you only have engagement if you're, you know, requested to do an interim or some activity. But with the VASH voucher holders, there's a, a regular cadence of meetings where we're constantly talking to our partners in this process. And it, it really helps to, to um, keep the VASH holder, voucher holders on the program. So if we're reaching out during times, like if we need to do an HQS inspection or an annual recertification and we're unable to reach the voucher holder, we are able to reach right out to our partners and get them involved and get that person back in communication so that we can help them to continue their participation under the program. A third thing that we wanted to also mention is about streamlining processes. You know, we hear this all the time from VASH and from regular voucher holders, right? Nobody wants to keep going through repeated processes with one agency and then repeat it again with the housing authority. So what we've done is we've created a portal where the referral and the paperwork, everything is able to come straight from our partners into our system so that we can expedite the review and eligibility process so that we can get that voucher into the hands of the VASH voucher holder as soon as possible. So that's very high level. I would like to um, also ask my team to jump in to highlight, like what for you, Robert, I would like for you to speak to your participation in the, the work group, the task force that happened throughout the city. Sure, Lakeisha, thank you. Uh, once again, my name is Robert Testerero. I'm director here at NYCHA, or at least Housing Section 8. And yeah, the Veterans uh, Task Force uh, Committee uh, has been around uh, since I believe 2014, 2015. And uh, we meet monthly. Um, it's a collaboration with various uh, city agencies, including the Mayor's Office, uh, Department of Veterans Services, uh, HRA, uh, DHS, uh, and of course, uh, our partners at the VA. And uh, the collaboration is great because we strategize ways to try and not only to get the veterans on the program, but to, to stabilize and keep them on the program. Because I think uh, a lot of that is where the veterans, they rent and then they have to obviously go through the requirements of the Section A program. So there's a lot of effort there as well, keeping them on the program. But certainly the Veterans uh, Committee uh, has been so successful. We target street homeless. Uh, trying to reduce that number to zero. And uh, we've been very successful over the years on that. Uh, the other thing we like to also emphasize, um, and again, with NYCHA, we, we utilize our technology. Uh, one of the main issues we have in here in New York City, and I'm sure across the country, it's a very tight rental market. Uh, units are not readily available, especially the affordability housing part of it. So we have our two portals, which is the what we call the owner extranet, where we tap into our 25,000 landlords uh, and encouraging them to list their vacant apartments uh, on our portal. And those available apartments uh, could be utilized to our VASH, our veterans uh, applicants and voucher holders searching. And we find that's very useful. So again, a total collaboration with city agencies, our internal technology is really helping us uh, rent our VASH veterans. Back to you, Lakeisha. Thank you, Robert. Um, Alex, I would like if you can just talk about streamlining that application process yes. for the veterans. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lakeisha. My name is Alex Matthew. Um, I'm the director for the Section 8 Application Unit, where we get the referral from the VA's office and we process the eligibility. And then I'm also in charge of the rental process, also putting them onto the program. So I just want to say, I want a big, big thank you to all the VA center that is in New York, helping us to make this a successful process, uh, project. And um, it has been big help with their support. And uh, I just want to say a big thank you to them, first of all. Our application process starts from referring the application. So the application, they, each agency, each <clears throat> center has a login uh, information and they make their referral on the portal. 
which creates a case in our system and they are up, able to upload the documents. Everything is uploaded through that portal and we get that information on the portal, uh, on our system. And once that uh, we receive the documents, we process the eligibility. And after we process the eligibility, we issue them uh, the voucher and we also issue them a PIN letter. Instead of giving them a rental package, we give them a PIN letter. With that PIN letter, the, uh, the veteran can look for an apartment with the support of the set, uh, the, all the VA center. They go, to a la they go to the landlord and landlord enters the PIN letter onto the owner extranet that we have built for all the owners. And in that, using that PIN letter, they're able to complete the rental package online. Once they complete the rental packages online, uh, the applicant can go in and sign, log into their, the tenant portal, and they are able to approve those rental packages. So this whole process, completion of rental packages, right after they find the apartment can be done within a day or two. Uh, it depends on how soon the veteran act and assign, uh, approves the rental document. Once we get the rental document, we schedule the inspection within five days after the, uh, within the, after, if the inspection passes, we process the, the movement letter, uh, conditional movement letter. And once we get the HAP contract back, we issue them the final movement letter. And I mean, it's been a very, it's been a successful uh, program for us. And we've been at 93% uh, of our allocation. And we've been doing that for a while. And uh, we've been above 90% for a while uh, in this program. I want to thank you and give it back to Leticia. Thank you, Alex. So I just want to highlight that um, that initial entry into the program is very important to make sure that that step is streamlined because we are dealing with a population that you, you don't know what you know situations they may be battling. So taking advantage of that step when they're with their caseworker and the ability to collect the documents at that point and have everything completed while they're with their VA caseworker is very helpful. So that is our program in a nutshell. Um, we are done if there are any um, questions or comments. Thank you all. Thank you, Lakeisha and Alex and Robert. Uh, immensely. And congrats on, I mean, such such really great leasing numbers and some really innovative practices there. Um, I don't know, uh, Michelle, if you're still on, if you want to just remind people, uh, we'll pause here for questions to how to ask questions um, over the phone, if you will. And then Molly, if there are any questions on the chat, we'll, we'll hit those as well. All right. Absolutely. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Perfect. So ladies and gentlemen, um, as a reminder to ask a question verbally, click the raise hand icon located at the bottom of your screen. This will place you in the queue. When it's your turn to speak, simply click the unmute button in the pop-up message that will appear on your screen. Please remember to state your name prior to your comments. Also, you may put, um, as Patrick indicated, you may put comments in the chat as well. All right, so far, I do not see anybody with their hand raised. I'm not sure if there's any um, questions in the chat. There is a question in the chat, and um, so hoping to pose this um, for our guests. Uh, it, so it's uh, the question is, it sounds like a lot of technical slash computer steps for a veteran who may or may not have access to such technology. How do you accommodate uh, the ones that cannot use or refuse to use this technology? That's a great question. Um, actually, that's that's part of the streamlining. We take advantage of any touch points that are happening with the VA. So when that referral and application are being completed, they're actually with their VA caseworker. So the, the burden is not on the vet to actually do that part that involves all of the technology. Their caseworker is actually assisting them through that process. 
And when it comes to the regular ongoing program requirements like the annual recertification, while we do prefer that most of our participants go online to complete those processes, we do have the ability for them to go into a walk-in center and receive assistance. So no one is mandated to use technology if that's not their comfort level. That was a great uh, explanation. Um, and it looks like we do have another question in the chat. Um, how do you keep engaging your VA partners? Uh, what is your meeting cadence? Um, and what do you think has been most effective in uh, keeping that engagement? It's definitely regular meetings. Um, Robert or Alex, you could jump in there and talk about the meetings. I know there, there are meetings that sometimes there are meetings particularly focused on compliance with the program, right? So we will share, you know, who's at risk for termination, who's not complying with the inspection process. And then there are more general meetings around, you know, if there are changes coming with HUD or anything that's going on locally that we need to discuss. Um, Robert, you can talk about the task force again. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And, and it is monthly and uh, the VA partners have been great. Uh, we have a great relationship with them over the years. And it's not just the meetings, it's the daily email exchanges and just maybe you know ad hoc phone calls. You just jump on and you speak with them and they've been great. But really the task force uh, is a collaboration of all city agencies with the VA. And like I said before, we, we basically talk about issues and try to resolve uh, problems that uh, could easily be resolved. In some cases, it can't, but we come up with plans. But having a constant dialogue with your local VA is the key to this program for VASH and all veterans. And we also have monthly meetings <clears throat> with, with the VA. We're like case, you know, they will send us a list of cases uh, for all different aspects, eligibility, rental, and recertification and uh, termination. In all these you know, different categories, they send us the list of cases and we do uh, staff follows up before the meeting. If they need to have a follow-up questions, they do have once a month, we do have a meeting with all the staff in all different departments. And like Robert said, we have we are in constant contact every day. I've been, I mean, I've been talking to both VA center that we have here and also the DVS team. I also want to point out that in addition, uh, a lot of times the VA will refer developers to NYCHA, right? So if they have a building that they're renovating when they want to rent to veterans, uh, certainly they uh, refer them to us. So we got a lot of referrals from them in that regard. So again, that's just a relationship that we have and it's really been beneficial. Uh, beneficiary for the for the program. Really great. Do the developers reach out to the VA in those situations? Yeah, a lot of they find out yeah, about it? absolutely. So the VA uh, basically will get uh, emails or calls and, you know, they do a lot of presentations. They do a lot of outreach and uh, they certainly will reach out to, to my office a lot of times, uh, whether it be for project based or tenant based. And, uh, you know, Alex and I, we jump on a call with the developers and we walk them through the program. We talk about HQS standards. We talk about rent reasonableness, um, everything to try and see if we can get more units added to our portfolio. We're always interested. Wow. Thanks. So I think the, the running theme between both of their responses is really about accessibility. Like we, we have to really make sure that we are constantly available to the VA and um, DVS. Um, I do see a couple more questions. Molly, do you wanna continue reading the questions or do you want me to read? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Not sure um, how many more questions we have time for uh, in this moment, um, Patrick. Yeah, let's just do uh, uh, let's do another one or two, and then um, if if there's time at the end, that uh, we'll we'll also try and get these questions answered by everyone um, with whatever ones we don't get to. Yeah, definitely want to make sure we are responsive to all the questions. And if you um, do not uh, get your answer, um, definitely follow up. Um, but uh, we'll go ahead and um, 
I'll tee up this one. Uh, do you have housing navigators or partners providing the housing search assistance? Um, our program, we're actually just creating a housing navigation program for NYCHA. Um, we're expecting to stand it up this summer. But for the VASH um, voucher holders, their caseworkers play a very important role in their housing search services. They're very hands-on. And especially our other partners at the mayor's office, the Department of Veteran Services, they are very actively engaged here in New York City. There is a huge push citywide to house veterans. So there, there's a lot of attention and, you know, advocating to get units for their, for the, um, their housing. Uh, one one quick final question for you guys. Thank you again for your time. Are your are the payment standards for VASH um, the same as your regular program, or are they higher? They are the same. So right now, our general program we have one hundred and ten percent of FMR, but we also, starting in April of this year, we rolled out exception payment standard for high opportunity neighborhoods which gives such a huge increase in searching power to the voucher holders. So we're learning lessons now on how, how that is really impacting the program. Great. Uh, thank you guys uh, again immensely uh, for this. And we may uh, be following up since more questions came in than we have time to get to. But uh, thank you again. Um, we're going thank you to... all for having us. Oh, yes, like thank you. Thank yeah. you. It was, it was our pleasure. We're going to hand it off now to, let me see if I can get this going again. Yes. Uh, still on the topic of best practices, of course. We're going to uh, go to our fearless questioner, uh, Molly Allen. And I am going to uh, immediately hand it off to uh, oh, my colleague, yeah. Jerry Ann Anthony. Thank you, guys. Uh, thank you, Patrick, Nigel, and Molly. And happy Friday Eve, everyone. Uh, so my name is Jerry Ann Anthony, and I'm a housing program specialist in PIH's Housing Voucher Management and Operations Division. Today, I'm joined by my colleague, Molly Allen, and together we'll spend the remaining time uh, reviewing some promising best practices in the HUD-BASH program. So data from the most uh, recent point in time count conducted by communities across the nation show a reduction in veterans homelessness by 55.3% since 2010. Uh, as the nation's largest permanent supportive housing program, the HUD-BASH program has been a critical component in a decline in veterans' homelessness. To continue building upon the success we've seen through the HUD-BASH program, HUD, the Department of Veteran Affairs, and the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness um, are prioritizing six strategies uh, to advance efforts to end veteran homelessness. Those strategies include uh, making vet veteran homelessness a priority. So senior officials from each of the three agencies convene regularly to develop targets, uh, assess progress and hold agencies accountable, uh, lead with an evidence-based housing first approach. So evidence in previous progress uh, in reducing veteran homelessness has proven that a housing first approach works. And so we're continuing with that model. Um, reach underserved veterans. So HUD, the VA, and USICH are working to identify and remove barriers uh, to VA care and services, uh, working extremely hard to increase the supply of affordable housing. Uh, uh, we all know that a significant obstacle to eradicating homelessness is the lack of affordable housing. And so all agencies are working to provide tools and resources to engage landlords and affording housing developers to create and subsidize affordable housing. Uh, ensure the delivery of supportive services. We all know that supportive services are critical in helping our veterans maintain us, uh, remain stably housed. And lastly, prevention. So strengthening crisis response systems across the nation uh, and developing resources to ensure that when and where possible, veteran homelessness can be prevented. Next slide, please. Uh, now let's talk landlord engagement and recruitment. So as I mentioned uh, on the previous slide, we all know that one of the biggest challenges communities face in eradicating homelessness is a lack of 
available, decent, and safe housing. So searching for housing can be extremely stressful uh, and may cause families to feel discouraged, leading to possible disengagement. Therefore, finding landlords is critical to both the success of the family and the program. Uh, so some successful uh, strategies to aid in landlord recruitment include consider hiring a person whose primary responsibility is to engage landlords and expand housing opportunities. So housing navigators, as they are sometimes called, uh, can play a major role in recruiting landlords. Uh, through their efforts, they can assist in marketing the program while educating prospective landlords about the program, potential to make a difference, process for participation and benefits. Um, identify, educate, and pre-screen owners. So take every opportunity possible to seek new landlords. Consider hosting landlord recruitment fairs where prospective landlords can learn more about the program. HUD offers a variety of tools and resources from program flyers to a full, to full toolkit to assist PHAs in engagement efforts. Develop MOUs or contractual ag agreements with local housing location services or continuums of care. So continuums of care have a good understanding of the challenges faced by many uh, families experiencing an episode of homelessness, and they may serve as a first line of defense for families encountering housing discrimination based on race, ethnicity, and other protected classes. Next slide, please. Uh, the following resources uh, are uh, some tools that have been designed to aid PHAs in recruitment and retention of landlords. Uh, so the, this list includes uh, Notice 2022-18, which outlines ex the expanded use of admin fees for landlord incentives, security deposits, and move-in assistance. Um, the hud Vash Landlord Materials, this second link is a link to a flyer, uh, which will be available to you when you have the slides, uh, which this flyer is a flyer that PHAs can utilize to market the hud Vash program specifically. Um, the third bullet is uh, the Landlord's Strategies Guidebook, which has a host of tips and tools to engage, recruit, and retain landlords. And last but not least, the Inspections Inspire webpage, uh, where you can learn more about Inspire and all that the agency is doing to improve the quality of housing for residents in a meaningful way. Next slide, please. Now let's discuss uh, some best practices in expediting the application and leasing process. So training. Uh, PHAs may consider periodic trainings for staff from partnering organizations and agencies on PHA and VA topics to ensure that all parties are aware of pertinent information. Topics such as HQS inspections, eligible housing units, uh, and the services and supports needed by veterans are helpful in ensuring that partners are aware of the PHA's process and can assist veteran families in navigating their journey to housing stability. Uh, as NYCHA indicated in their presentation, regular meetings are key to program success and taking opportunities in those meetings to train your partners on updated guidance and regulations will prove beneficial uh, for program success. Uh, preparing for the VA benefits application and screening for case management. So applying for veteran benefits, housing, and services can be overwhelming for families experiencing an episode of homelessness. Collaborating with partnering organizations to help in the application process alleviates pressure on the veteran family and provides support throughout the process. Uh, VA and continuum of care partners may be helpful in aiding veterans in obtaining documentation. Uh, partnering VA MCs may additionally offer consultations where veterans can call or visit uh, with questions regarding veteran eligibility for hud -VASH and other VA benefit programs. Um, and these strategies uh, will help to ensure that when veterans arrive at the VA MC to submit applications, VA staff spend less time helping veterans obtain documents and determine whether or not they qualify for the program. HCV uh, application completed before meeting with the PHA. So a very widespread practice that we've seen uh, PHAs implement is uh, providing all the forms and a list of documents required for the, v for the HUD-VASH application to the VAMC. 
Case managers can then work with veterans to fill out the forms and compile all documents prior to meeting with the PHA and submitting applications. Another strategy to consider is simultaneous HCV application completion and housing search. So PHAs may consider allowing veterans to complete the voucher application and housing search packet at the same time. Allowing the application and housing search to occur simultaneously provides the VAMC with an opportunity to work with veterans to complete the application, obtain necessary documentation, while also searching for a unit. Subsequently, when veterans attend their orientation, they submit both their applications and requests for tenancy, which thereby reduce the number of days in the leasing process. Uh, issuing a provisional voucher while completing a check for lifetime sex offender registration. To reduce time in, in processing uh, in a processing of HUD, of, sorry, to reduce time in processing of HUD VASH uh, applications, PHAs may consider conducting a preliminary check on the National Offender Search Tool. And then if the veteran is not on the list, issuing a provisional voucher. Doing so will allow the veteran family to begin the housing search process with a provisional voucher while the PHA awaits official confirmation on sex offender status from the FBI da database. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, simultaneous HQS inspection and re rent reasonableness determination. So if your PHA has one department completing the HQS inspection and another department negotiating rent reasonableness with the landlord, consider allowing for both the inspection and rent reasonableness determination to be completed simultaneously. This process change will save time. Developing a pool of pre-inspected units. PHAs who maintain a pool of pre-inspected units afford families the ability to view and select units for which they may be interested and may reduce the amount of time a family spends locating safe, decent, affordable housing. Consider contracting out referral to lease-up activities. So PHAs may consider contracting with another entity to conduct briefings, assist with the housing search process, process RTAs, determine rent reasonableness, calculate rent and housing assistance payments, and perform HQS inspections. Uh, and lastly, carrying out a system redesign or process mapping workshop. So consider hosting a brainstorming session with uh, partners from the VA to take a detailed look at your existing system. Um, in this setting, you can outline the steps from referral to lease up and analyze the amount of time spent on average to complete each of the steps in your process. Uh, from there, brainstorm ways to increase efficiency, reduce time, streamline processes, and develop a plan to improve. Um, as NYCHA indicated, uh, many PHAs have seen success when taking a look at their current referral process and trying to uh, come up with more innovative ways to save time and create a more efficient process. Next slide, please. Consider project basing HUD VASH vouchers. So there are tons of benefits to PBVing HUD VASH vouchers. PBV projects can increase or preserve the supply of affordable housing in a community. They can help deconcentrate poverty and encourage development in opportunity areas. They also can address specific veteran housing needs as many offer co-located services. And finally, PBVs may improve HCV program efficiency. Um, just as a reminder, there are no additional no additional HUD approval is needed to PBV uh, HUD VASH vouchers beyond the standard OFO PBV notification process. Uh, there has been some, some confusion or questions uh, about the PBV notice 2017-21, um, like what it means when it says without requiring additional HUD approval for VASH. Uh, this should not be interpreted as no HUD approval required, but what it actually means is that there isn't HUD approval required above and beyond the normal PBV process when project basing uh, HUD VASH vouchers, um, and all PBV requirements still apply. Next slide, please. Special housing types. 
So another best practice worth considering is the use of special housing types. Um, I think we heard from from Nitra. Well, we heard from Nitra that they're doing more P, more in the space of PBV, um, but other special housing types may also provide additional uh, housing opportunities for HUD bash uh, families. Um, so according to our HUD bash operating requirement requirements. PHAs must uh, permit HUD bash families to use special housing types for tenant based HUD bash assistance. This includes single room occupancies or SROs, um, congregate housing, group homes, shared housing, and uh, co cooperative housing. So, HUD bash may be used in uh, some types of assisted living settings, uh, which may be ideal for aging veterans as well. Um, I'll now turn the presentation over to my colleague, Molly Allen, Senior Housing Program Specialist in HBMOD to share a few other best practices. Thank you, Jerry Ann. Um, yeah, just uh, to touch on a few other things um, to note in this best practices uh, in HUD bash discussion. Um, an another general practice um, we just want to note here is uh, to make sure that um, you're not over screening HUD bash veterans. Um, as we know, HUD VASH veterans um, are only subject to the two eligibility criteria at the PHA, and that's the income eligibility and the lifetime sex offender status. So this is just a reminder that HUD VASH income eligibility does go up to um, and include uh, low income veterans, so those up to 80% of AMI. Um, and just also wanted to note that because the lifetime sex offender uh, designations are based on state law, it's just generally good practice to stay up to date on any changes um, to those laws. Uh, next slide, please. So in general, uh, we want to stress uh, a veteran-centered approach, acknowledging that the needs um, can be different for each veteran. And to facilitate this, we recommend, um, you know, coordination and regular communication, as as I think we've we've all been touching on today, um, with the VA case management team, as well as uh, looping in other local partners. Um, noting that while the HUD bash operating requirements do specify some basic requirements for PHAs and VAMCs. There is also flexibility there to further define roles and responsibility between the VAMC, the PHAs, and, and other local partners. Um, as I think was well articulated by NYCHA, uh, veteran success often requires on ongoing effort from all partners working in tandem. Um, and this can even include the physical co-location of staff, like providing space for VA case managers and partners in PHA office space. Uh, next slide, please. So this graphic is just an illustration of all the ways in which HUD, the VA, the PHA, as well as other kind of complementary VA and COC programs can work together to support the HUD bash veteran in a veteran centered approach. Um, communication between partners and then within the um, uh, uh, the program can help ensure retention um, in the program uh, and uh, and or positive exits from the program. Next slide, please. So as discussed, um, the establishment and maintenance of regular communication is essential for long-term program effectiveness, um, providing information to all partners about the status of each applicant, as well as um, veterans that are already leased up, ensures uh, that issues of concern are addressed in a timely manner and veterans are less likely to um, fall through the cracks uh, and this proactive front end work can really help ensure that small roadblocks don't become uh, giant issues. Uh, next slide, please. To uh, ensure the optimized efficiency and impact of the program, it can be incredibly helpful for uh, nearby PHAs partnered with a single VAMC to communicate and coordinate between each other to make program um, administration more seamless and efficient. Uh, this can include trying to make their processes mirror each other. It can include um, setting consistent HUD bash payment standards across the region. Um, it can also include uh, HUD bash PHAs agreeing to operate within each other's jurisdictions, of course, based on ability depending on state law. Um, and this can be done by you know, entering into an MOU or an MOA uh, between each other. 
Um, however, if it is ultimately determined that veterans uh, in that catchment area could be more efficiently served by another PHA in the catchment area, there's also the option to look at um, the HUD-VASH reallocation process as detailed in notice PIH uh, 2022-25, um, and that is highlighted here. Uh, next slide, please. So I think that uh, that wraps up our presentation, um, and I, uh, you know, we're willing to take some some questions here as well. Um, I'm not sure if we still have our uh, NYCHA guests to um, potentially speak to any other questions for the PHA. Yes, we're here for another five minutes. Awesome. There was a question around how many referrals we receive each month. Um, and it's around 15 to 20 applications a month. So if anyone certainly has a, a question, I think you can raise your hand and, and Michelle will help you get unmuted to ask. I don't know, Molly, if there are any others left. Um, or New York before they have to hop off here in a minute, and then uh, and then we can do those first, and then there for any for us, we could take those after. Yeah, I think um, I wanted to highlight this question around um, uh, work uh, working with landlords um, and do uh, do you encounter a lot of issues since HUD bash screening um, is so lenient. Uh, to qualify for the voucher, do you have issues with landlords uh, not wanting to rent to veterans, um, you know, due to background issues? Um, do you offer any type of landlord incentives uh, to encourage uh, landlords to engage with the program? Yes. So um, it's not just the vast population, it's just Section 8 in general. We have some income discrimination issues here in New York City. So we, we do partner with um, the Commission on Human Rights to make sure that people have a resource to follow up on that experience. Uh, we also offer a um, one month hold fee to incentivize the landlord to participate in the program. I do not currently see any questions in the audio queue. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, pressing the raise hand icon and then um, clicking on the pop up that comes on your screen will enter you into the verbal question queue. So I saw um, uh, a question in the chat around um, maintaining a pool of units that meet HQS and to say that that is a special um, HUD-VASH uh, operating requirement um, that for HUD-VASH uh, PHAs can pre-inspect units um, up to uh, 45 days uh, in advance um, and uh, maintain a pool of eligible units for HUD-VASH. Again, um, it's uh, regular rules against, um, you know, steering folks to those units uh, still apply, um, but that is an option in the HUD-VASH program specifically. Um, and we also got a question around um, uh, HUD-VASH porting, uh, and if you do not have an available HUD-VASH voucher, um, can you absorb um, or do you have to bill for it? And I would say that depends on if you have um, your own HUD-VASH program and if uh, the veteran is moving from another VAMC catchment area or if they are still being served by the same um, VA medical center that they were previously served by. And so those um, kind of different porting scenarios are all outlined in the operating requirements. Um, but in general, if the veteran is receiving consistent case management from the same VA medical center and the PHA, both PHAs, the initial and the receiving have a HUD-VASH program, um, then you have the option to absorb or to bill. Um, but if the veteran is moving um, like across the country from another um, uh, VA medical center, 
uh, then the option is to absorb into the HUDBASH um, program. Uh, so there's um, kind of all the different uh, stipulations there, depending on what the exact porting scenario is. Uh, just wanted to hop in real quick, and I know you guys have to hop up, but thank you again, Lakeisha and Alex and Robert. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you as well. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good have one. Have a great afternoon. You as well. Bye-bye. Molly, any, uh, any more? What do we got? Um, I think uh, so there is a general question around um, are we doing anything to track uh, housing authorities use of admin fees to increase landlord retention. Um, yeah, so I guess Patrick that's I, I, I do not know of any way that that is um, being rolled into anything uh, uh, quantitative um, on how those admin fees are being used. That's fair. And there are currently no audio um, questions. I think we're okay to wrap up, Molly and Jerry Ann. Thank you both immensely. Okay. Well, thank you everybody uh, for joining today. A few reminders up on the screen, basically sort of restating the opening. Don't forget that those uh, set asides applications that are due tomorrow for some of those key categories. Uh, you know, next webinar is uh, the 20th of July. It's about a month from now. Uh, by all means, register. We've got our topics up there. We're doing some adjustments, building them out again, so you can see a little bit out into the future. Uh, yep, this will be re recorded, obviously, and posted here in about a week. Uh, we'll get all those links that we mentioned there. Sorry, I wasn't able to post with sharing. That's I apologize about that. And then again, uh, if you want to sign up for HTV Connect, by all means. But thank you guys all for joining today. Remember, any uh, topics of interest, do let us know, and we'll see if we can set something up for one of these upcoming webinars. And uh, thank you again, uh, Molly and Jerry and Luigi, if you're, if you're still on for joining us today. And uh, any questions on uh, any of this, feel free. They, we've got the email addresses in there, uh, the mobility uh, questions as well. I know uh, Allison's had, pardon me, happy to get those. And uh, I wish you guys all a great Thursday. Thank you much. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.